So good, good morning, all students. Thanks for joining us for our pathways in um, uh, the physical electronics and photonics area. Um, today presenting, we have Dr. Meng Tao, who is uh, the area chair of this area. Um, and he will get started in just a moment. And what I'm gonna recommend for questions, because we encourage students to interact, is to please put them in the chat box um, and then I'll help moderate those at the end. So if you have questions, please put them in as you see them. If they're advising related questions, we might answer those in the chat so everybody can hear. Um, if they're directly for Dr. Tao, we'll save those for the end. Um, so thank you, Dr. Tao, for being here and please get started when you're ready. Okay, good, thank you, Bob. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we do this uh, every semester and uh, we usually do it in person, but with this pandemic, we have to do it in uh, through Zoom. So, uh, but uh, now my email address is here. My office phone number is here. So if you want, you have additional questions after uh, the uh, today's uh, meeting, and you can certainly contact me. And uh, uh, if I don't know the answer, I will try to get the right person uh, with the, that information for you. Okay, so physical electronics and photonics, and uh, we are the largest area of program within ECEE. We have like 30, uh, actually we have one new uh, faculty member. So we have 31 faculty members this semester. And uh, here is a list of the faculty members who are, uh, uh, associated with uh, physical electronics, photonics. And uh, nationally, we are also ranked pretty well and uh, post for the undergraduate program and also the graduate program. Yeah, I forgot I, next time I need to put in the online program. We rank really well for our online program. So what is uh, physical electronics? Now here on top of this slide, uh, there's a sentence which says, uh, the science and technology of materials, devices, and systems that involve the control of electrons. Now, I hope you still remember from your chemistry 101 or, or physics 101, and if you break down materials down to atoms, and you break down, look, break down the atoms, you have a nucleus and you have electrons. So our job in physical electronics is to manipulate and control the electrons in those atoms for information processing, for power controlling, and for everything we do in our modern life. So it's the control of electrons which we work on. So just a little bit of history of uh, how we started this. And uh, now all of you are not old enough. And uh, when I was your age, I still saw a, my dad had a, a radio uh, 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 set of which has like six of these vacuum tubes inside them. When you turn it on, they all glow and they so, uh, 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 glow at the night so you can see the light from the radio set. But that takes a lot of power. Like one radio set takes like 100 to 200 watts of power to, to it. But nowadays with, with uh, uh, even your, your, your computer, which is like a billion times more powerful than, than the six uh, vacuum tubes. But they take like a 50 watts of power and why these six guys take like 100 watts of power. So you see, we are really trying to minimize the, the, the device size, minimize the power and the button to do more with less power, less uh, space. So, and uh, this is the older one Then in 1947 that in Bell Laboratories and uh, uh, John Barty and his colleagues invented the first solid state transistor. That's really the beginning of all the, uh, 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 like your cell phone, your TV sets, your laptop, all the modern day electronics really started from that day. And then uh, I think it was 1957 I saw and uh, yeah, QB at uh, Texas Instruments decided to put a bunch of these transistors and other components in a circuit uh, to a single silicon chip. That really started uh, the modern day uh, integrated circuits which go into your uh, cell phone laptop. Uh, almost all electronics you use actually have some kind of uh, silicon chips inside. 
So this is one example of the chips, which has uh, nowadays this chip is about the size of about an inch by inch in size, but it can contain like uh, 20 billion transistors inside. Remember the radio said my daddy had a, had a six vacuum tubes in it, and now you have like a billion more devices in, in a chip than a radio set in, in say 50 years ago. So you see how much progress we have made. Now the, really the most impressive progress we have made is on these computers. This is the, probably one of the earliest computers which takes like a size of maybe two, three, four classrooms and draws like thousands, not even thousands, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of watts of power into it to run it. But it's not that it, it's the functionality is probably just a tiny fraction of your laptop today. That's how much progress we made. That's all by physical electronics that is we not know how to control those electrons in a semiconductor to a very precise level, very tiny level. So, and uh, now photonics. Uh, uh, it's the science and the technology of generating, controlling, and detecting light or photons, which is particle of lights. And I'm not sure how much you remember from physics, quantum uh, mechanics, and uh, light. And uh, in quantum mechanics, are also like electrons, like particles. So we want to control these uh, light particles, which we call photons. So a good example is the laser point and uh, your professors often use uh, in lectures and uh, that's a, a classic photonic device. And uh, solar cells is another type of photonic device, which is uh, my focus area. And then optical fiber that's also controlling photons and all the transatlantic and transpacific communications are done through optical fiber. And uh, I added this slide just to show you. And now uh, this is a, a, a very hot topic these days. And that is, uh, we all, we hear the talks about the global warming, about the burning fossil fuels, about the uh, solar energy. Now, this is a solar system installed uh, on the ground. But if you come to ASU campus, uh, almost all the collages, if you look at the rooftop, they have the solar system on the roof. So how do we make these sort of modules? And uh, so we start with quads and then we reduce quads is silicon dioxide. We reduce silicon dioxide to silicon and remove the oxygen from the silicon. Then we purify that silicon to get this what we call polysilicon, which is a very, very ultra, ultra pure uh, silicon. Then we make an ingot out of the ultra pure polysilicon, then cut the ingot into wafers. And on the wafers, we make cells, and then we use 60 cells also to, in a module to make a module. Then a solar system just has tons, tons, tons of modules, you know, probably on the order of tens of thousands of modules make a solar system. So that's how we make a solar system. And uh, here is a little bit of history of the transistor, uh, the integrated circuits. Now this shows, yeah, I have a little bit difficult to see the uh, full slide on my screen because uh, in the other things are uh, uh, covering the part of the screen. But you can see if this probably starts from 1970s. Uh, now it ends about 2010 and uh, we were at the 2021. So this curve actually extends a little bit beyond uh, beyond what's here. But if what you look at is here, the vertical axis is the number of transistors we are putting on a single chip. And the horizontal axis is the time. You can see that the vertical axis actually is a log scale. So we are, the number of transistors we are putting on chip increases exponentially with time. Every two years, we double the number of transistors we are putting on chip, and this goes up to one billion transistors per chip, but we are in 2021, 20, uh, so we are putting about 10 to 20 billion transistors on a single chip. 
And the number of transistors you put on a chip actually is the indication of its functionality. So the more transistors you put on a chip, the more functional, uh, uh, more powerful the uh, chip is. So that's why this is a good indication of the uh, power of a computer chip can have. Now, semiconductor industry, and uh, this is a little bit of old data. Yeah, I didn't update this. Right now, it's about $400 billion or for the year, $50 billion per, per year uh, global uh, revenue for the semiconductor industry. And I'm not sure if we follow the news from the, uh, at the federal level. And uh, re recently, we have a shortage of semiconductor chips. So the White House is in, uh, uh, reviewing uh, the supply chain issues with semiconductor chips. And on one hand, uh, a lot of these semiconductor chips are made in the US, but also a lot of them made in like South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. So they are actually talking to those countries to, to guarantee the supply chain for uh, the, uh, all the other industries which rely on these chips. So that means a good job perspective for you guys if you want to get into semiconductors. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, yeah, next time I will also provide this is slide. And the photonics market, uh, and uh, now photonics market is not as, uh, they are, if you look at the number of products sold in the photonics market, uh, it's much more than the semiconductor chips you're selling. So semiconductor chips, one chip can do a lot of different things and in photonics, uh, you have one device doing one job and then another device doing another job. So you don't have as, you just have a much a larger number of products in the photonics market, but overall it's still a very, very big market and uh, $700 billion in 2021 production. And uh, so overall size is about the same as the semiconductors, but uh, in terms of number of products, Photonics market has a lot more products on the market than the, the semiconductor market. And uh, now this gets into a semiconductor electronics and uh, uh, your computer is a very good example. If you have extra money you want to break down your laptop <laughs> but I, I don't suggest you don't, don't, do, don't do that but if you have extra money and you can you break it down there are probably a dozen or so chips inside each chip is about uh, one inch by one inch in size so without the semiconductor chips you just don't have your computer you don't have your cell phone you don't have a lot of the electronics the electronic gadgets you use today you're kind of used to and uh, these chips perform analog and digital circuit functions. And uh, these chips contain, I said, mentioned that the, the, the most advanced chips contain like 10 or 20 billion transistors in it. Um, so these semiconductor devices have to be designed, fabricated, uh, uh, measured, modeled, marketed, sold. So what you need is one is a semiconductor device physics circuit design, and you also need the fabrication techniques to make these chips, you need to do measurement and then you need to do modeling. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen, uh, not recently, but I remember like five years ago, Intel used to have a, a, a ad on TV, which shows that how you need, to, how you look like when you work in one of the Intel factories, which they call fabs. and. Uh, you have to dress up, cover all your surface skin uh, skin areas with with gloves, with uh, 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 guns, with uh, face masks, with a uh, 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 hair cap, with everything. So you don't have even a any of your skin exposed in that environment. That's how you you do the fabrication. So that's uh, yeah, kind of amazing that video. Maybe I should pull that pull up that video someday. And now, if you look at the what's going on within ASU, within ECEE -E in uh, electronics and photonics, and uh, this is what we call a molecular beam epitaxy system to glow these all 
produce these semiconductor devices. And it's, uh, it's a really expensive machine. So this machine probably costs several million dollars easily. And, uh, and then we also have this clean movement facility. If you come to engineering research center and uh, on the first floor, we have a very sophisticated uh, application facility called the clean room. That's well, this looks very similar to Intel's fabs, but not, certainly is not uh, the most advanced fabs. So uh, this person inside has goggles, but uh, there's still skin exposed if you look at the, around the, uh, her face. If you go to Intel, uh, you don't, they don't allow you to ex even expose an inch of your, 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 uh, of your, your skin in that environment. So now, of course, we are not at the level of Intel's requirement yet. So that's why we don't go that extreme, but uh, but it just does give you some idea of what's required in, in that environment. And then we also faculty are looking at the lasers, LEDs. We also have faculty members who are looking at the white laser. Now, white laser, if you remember that uh, white, white light is not a single wavelength light. And the lasers air it is all emitted at a particular wavelength. So in order to create a white laser, you need the multiple single wavelength lasers and mix them in the right proportion to generate a white light. So it's not that straightforward. So you can have blue laser, you can have green laser, you can have a red laser, but it, to have a white laser, you need a study of them in the right proportion, then you have a white laser beam coming out. So that's a quite impressive. Then also photovoltaics is another thing uh, we are working on. I'm one of the faculty members who focus on photovoltaics. And uh, so what do engineers do in the semiconductor industry? And the circuit design is one. Uh, semiconductor device uh, circuit simulation and the modeling and uh, because the simulation is faster and cheaper than actually doing the physical experiments and uh, fabrication and uh, maintain good yield, good throughput and uh, measurement characterization and uh, for devices, circuits and chips and the sales marketing. So if you look at the job opportunity, here's some of the companies which are uh, in, in physical electronics, photonics uh, locally. We have Freescale, we have ARM Semiconductor, we have Intel, and I'm not sure if Freescale is still in existence, And uh, but Intel has a big presence in Phoenix area. And the micro is in Idaho, I mean, in Idaho, then Texas Instruments, the headquarters is in Dallas. National Semiconductor, I think, headquartered in, in the Bay Area and uh, ST Micro Electronics Global Foundry. Uh, now, this is a, yeah, I'm not sure how much you follow um, uh, this industry. And a new business model these days is that the fabrication and uh, making end product that is the chips uh, and uh, for a specific device, for example, say your, your, your iPhone or your computer. Actually, the guy who designs, the company which designs these chips and the company which fabricates these chips are two separate companies. And so that's called the foundry model. And the global foundry is a US based foundry. And in Taiwan, there are a number of uh, foundry companies. And one of them will be building a, a foundry in Phoenix, and uh, it will be up and running by 2024. So you could end up uh, working for, for uh, TSMC, and uh, that's a foundry. And IBM, HP, Dell, Apple, and the Photonics. Now, these are tend to be very big companies. Intel is like a hundred billion dollar a year company, and the Photonics company tend to be a little bit smaller because they have more products on the market. Uh, so each product has a little bit smaller market uh, and uh, smaller uh, annual revenue. So that's why you have more companies create Amico and I have a friend, a friend working for Amico. And uh, yeah, some of the company I don't even know. And uh, Raytheon, Raytheon is, is a big defensive contract for you, Lockheed Martin. Yeah, 
of semiconductor equipment manufacturing, a prime material, this is the number one uh, semiconductor equipment manufacturer. The manufacturer is working there. Uh, KL Tanker. Uh, yeah, I had a PhD student who graduated a couple of years ago and now works for KL Tanker in Portland, Oregon. And uh, digital instruments, adjuvant, uh, K3, and the uh, solar industry. And uh, the biggest solar company in the US is First Solar. And if you drive from as you to uh, Sky Harbor and you will drive by the headquarter and uh, but their manufacturing is in Ohio and uh, some power and headquarter is in Bay Area and the service company is which provide like software for simulation and uh, also some companies which provide like specialty gases for the semiconductor industry and uh, so there are different companies which provide different services but this is also one thing I want to uh, emphasize. If you if you have a bad degree in electrical engineering and your job is not the upside is that you are more flexible. You can fit into all kinds of jobs in the semiconductor industry. But uh, on the other hand, you will be really doing entry level job work. It's not going to be that much technical, a little bit technical, but not that much technical. And uh, so there are things which are good, there are things which are not as good. So if you are, want a more specialized job with more job security, then you want maybe want to consider advanced degrees like a master degree or even PhD degree. And uh, master degree is a pretty good degree because you have a little bit more book knowledge now and uh, you can have more value to the company and, uh, but you are not overly specialized. So can, you can still fit into a wide range of jobs and but you have more knowledge experience and so you have more value to the company. And uh, PhD is very, very specialized and uh, it gives you a, yeah, in a corporate ladder, you join with a PhD, then you are already at like, like two levels above a bachelor degree. And also for certain companies, for like Intel, they are, if you want to get into their fab, and nowadays they seldom hire people without a PhD degree. More than half of the engineers working in their fab, they actually have, probably have a PhD degree. Intel has tons of thousands of, uh, of PhDs a year. So just because the, the one of the reasons is that the, the price tag for a Intel to build a new fab is on the order of $10 billion. I'm not sure if you follow the news of TSMC. The fab they are building in Phoenix and uh, the price tag is $12 billion. One fab, $12 billion. So if you look at even one machine inside that fab, that machine is $50 million a machine, you know, one piece of machine. And so that type of machine, yeah, they just don't feel comfortable putting a bachelor degree. <laughs> yes, okay, you run this $50 million machine. Yeah, it's just that, uh, yeah, if you ever make a mistake that uh, the fab is shut down, then each day the fab is not producing, they lose. Uh, $50 million, $100 million. So they are just not comfortable putting bachelor degrees and running those machines in charge of those, those machines. So that's why they hire so many PhDs in Intel fabs. And then I'm pretty sure TSMC will hire a lot of PhDs as well. So this is probably a good time if you uh, want a more job security, high, much higher pay and uh, uh, much important the low to a company. And uh, so probably look at uh, Master even PhD is, is a good idea. Now also for some of you, if you want to have academic position, now without PhD, you cannot get a faculty position or a national level position even. And uh, yeah, here shows the salary, weekly salary. And again, the data is a little bit obsolete. And uh, yeah, I couldn't find the new, the new data. So uh, I don't know where, where uh, Trevor found the data here. You can see that uh, PhD, professional degrees, professional means lawyers or, or medical doctors, 
you'll see these are the highest paid position in electrical engineering is uh, well paid uh, with the basis, uh, master basis, uh, mass degree is lower, bachelor degree lower. If, if you don't have a bachelor degree, you can uh, just go down. Then also job security is another issue at unemployment rate. Uh, yeah, this pandemic is a good example. If you look at the people who suffer the most, uh, those uh, with lowest skill, Actually, if you look at the faculty members, I don't see any of us got got laid off, got a, 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 a reduction of a salary. So, the higher the degree you have, the more secure your job is. But not only you get good pay, but you also have better job job security. Now, the courses required, and uh, uh, now I'm only talking about the electives here. We have a couple of uh, like. Uh, uh, required courses in physical electronics photonics, uh, but we also have a number of uh, electrical courses for 34 quantum mechanics for engineers, 435 fundamentals on CMOS MEMS, and 436 fundamentals on solid state devices, uh, 437 electronics. 439 semiconductor facility cleaning practices. Now, this is the class which prepares you to work in a fab. And, uh, Professor Kaziki uh, teaches that cause. And the 465 is also a cause I really strongly recommend it because in the future, solar energy will be a big industry. And uh, this is the entry level class you want to take uh, if you are interested in solar energy, photovoltaic energy conversion. Now, you don't have to take all of these courses, but you certainly need to take a, a, a number of these courses if you want to specialize in physical electronics and photonics. Okay, so th those are all the slides I have, and uh, uh, maybe uh, we, I can try to answer some of your questions. And uh, now, of course, uh, after today, if you have additional questions, and you can always email me. And uh, uh, but uh, let's see if there are any questions you have now. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Tao. Yes, students, please add any questions you have to the chat. We'd be happy to <coughs> answer those. Um, he gave some good advice on professional pathways you can take in a, um, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, while we're waiting for those, uh, we typically recommend at this point that all students who are curious about learning more about the area and want to talk to faculties or maybe think about research areas that they uh, look on our website at the faculty by research area bios. So for example, if you were curious about um, any one of the areas on this last slide here, um, there are faculty who either teach the course or have research interests in them. Um, so a conversation with them is great. Office hours are a great way to ask questions like that. Yeah, here's a list of the faculty names. Yeah, so the, each faculty has a website, so that's a, a, a probably the right, yeah. The, best uh, 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 way to reach out to faculty and uh, is to go through their website first and uh, see what they are doing and uh, see whether that's of interest to you. If so, then uh, reach out to them. I can give you my own example. Right now I have uh, two undergraduate students working with me and uh, one master student who actually still a undergraduate student, but he will graduate this semester and then he wants to do a full pass the work first for a master degree. Then after that, he wants to continue with a PhD. So, uh, so this, this is a undergraduate student to PhD. <laughs> we'll see that. And then I also have four PhD students working with me right now. Um, Dr. Okay, here we go. We got a question from Phil. Um, so Phil is asking you, Dr. Tao, several of these courses on the last slide are currently not offered through the online program. Is there a timeline to offer these through online? Yeah, uh, we are in the process of offering a online uh, uh, bachelor degree program. So I think that the 434 now is online. 435 is not yet. 436 is not yet. 437, 430, 439 is difficult to offer online because it's a lab course, so it's kind of a little bit difficult to do. And well, but, but maybe uh, <laughs> we will get a little creative and figure out a way to do it online. 
Uh, there's also a plan to uh, offer this 465 online. And actually, I'm talking with another professor, Professor Gorio, and uh, he will lead the effort. I will help him when uh, we talk of lecture, and he will lead the weeks of lecture. So we do have some plan to, some is offered online, not everything, but uh, uh, hopefully we will have more online courses over the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you. And then um, we, we will get, as soon as they are offered, we put them on our three-year course plan, which um, Cheryl on the call here, she updates that very frequently. So um, mm -hmm. no, as soon as we get those developed, they'll, they'll be out there. Yeah. I also put in the chat, if you'd like to look at faculty by research area, please, please check that out. That's a, that's a useful way to do it. And um, it looks like people are being a little bit shy, Dr. Tao, so I will ask a very basic question that sometimes the earlier students ask, is uh, how would you define this area, the pet area, as different than um, just studying the circuit area? Uh, your voice was kind of in and out, so I did not hear full sentence. Yeah, let me try again. So, some students are shy and don't ask. It's a very fundamental question, but we often get asked, um, what is the difference between this, this area, physical electronics and photonics, and students who are just curious about the circuits area, because we do, we do them differently. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, good. Yeah, so this is more, this area is more physics and chemistry based a little bit. And uh, so if you look at the, the faculty in this area, some have a, a PhD in physics, uh, myself have a PhD in material science, uh, some have a PhD in, 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 even in chemical engineering. And uh, so it's not, of course, a, a large number also have a PhD in, in electrical engineering as well. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the, Next is our like uh, physics, chemistry, electrical engineering. While if you work on circuit design, that's a that's just a one hundred percent electrical engineering subject. So if you look at the faculty there, they all have degrees in electrical engineering. But here you can see faculty from different academic backgrounds and disciplines, and but we all work on the same goal to make a more better electronic devices and photonic devices. Thank you. That's that's helpful. That's something that helps uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know clarify it for students. I don't think we have any other questions in here. People are being shy today, but we did have up to over twenty students at some point. So um, uh, <laughs> thanks again for doing this. Uh, uh, any of the yeah, students? For, for, yeah, for all the students. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you, yeah. Let me show the first slide. My email address. So if you have additional questions after today, now this is how you can reach me. Email is probably the easiest way, and I'm not always in office, so uh, email is the, uh, the best way to reach me. And okay, wait one minute. we have one student who is currently vigorously typing something, so I'll let him finish typing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so Hakan, please, yeah, please take the like question. <laughs> okay, good. good. Yeah, the... Yeah, so and... Uh, also, if you are interested in research, and ASU has this program called the FULIN, for the undergraduate research initiative, you just Google ASU FULIN, F-U-R-I, and it will pop up, and then you can see the faculty who have different research topics, and you go through that. If a topic is of particular interest to you, then you can reach out to that faculty and then chat a little bit and learn a little bit more and see whether, whether it resonates with your and uh, uh, that faculty is interested in your and if so then you can write a, yeah a field proposal get a funded get money for it yeah good 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 thank you um while we're waiting for Hakan's question Daniel uh is asking if these will be recorded yes Daniel we'll we'll post these to our um, website um it might take a couple of weeks to get it there I think we're having a uh, we're gonna have to work with our web folks to get them there uh we I think we already um, the, putting them on a little sooner than that these days, which is nice. So maybe end of the day, maybe end of the week. Okay, so keep checking. Okay, and then we have a question from um, Hakan. He's um, saying it, it seems like this pathway requires a master's or PhD to start working in non-entry level positions. Since I'm not planning attending graduate school, it doesn't seem like this pathway is recommended. Do you agree with that statement, Dr. Tom? Uh, there are still other opportunities you can work on, and uh, uh, depends on what you you want to work on. 
if you want, for example, if you want to be a device engineer, then without advanced degree, it's probably very difficult. You're not going to take a bachelor degree uh, as a device engineer. But if you work as say equipment engineer for, for TSMC for Intel, that's still possible. If you are really hands-on type of person, you just want to work with equipment and that's still possible. So depends on if you just want a, a marketing position or, or tech service engineer type position, then it can still be uh, it's still possible. Yeah, but the certain type of positions, uh, yes, it's difficult to, to, to get a non-entry level position with a, without an advanced degree. And the main being device engineer is it's, it's, it's a required advanced degree. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, uh, I um, kind of rounding out that it's, it's generally the best advice that I can always give to a student is to pick the area they're most interested in. Career and professional options often open their doors to students who are studying the field that they're really, really interested in. Um, but, but that said, you need to have the background on the professional stuff. So please, please watch your handshake account here through the Fulton Career Center um, for opportunities um, and uh, look them up. And you can tailor almost any focus area to a, to a job. Um, but as you specialize, of course, advanced study is needed. Now, and also, Phoenix, uh, not. If you want to uh, uh, move away from Phoenix after your, uh, 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 after your graduation, that's an uh, option. But if you like to stay in Phoenix, then we have very, very strong uh, semiconductor industry here. Intel has multiple fabs here, uh, uh, on semiconductor is here. And uh, we also have like solar companies also very strong here uh, compared to the rest of the country. And the past TSMC building this huge, enormous fab in Phoenix. So, yeah, if you want to have a job in the semiconductor industry, I think there are only a very limited location you can go to. Bay Area, if you are willing to pay like uh, two million dollars for for a condo, <laughs> you can go to Bay Area. Uh, Portland, Oregon is another option, and for semiconductor job, and the Phoenix is, is one of the three top three options here. Well, thank you, um, Hakan, um, Daniel, and uh, um, uh, Phil. Those of you who ask questions, it's always helpful. Thanks for speaking up. And um, thank you again, Dr. Tao, for presenting today. Yeah, good. thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just uh, reach out to me if you have more questions. Okay, good.